fauna. The ESC sports setting can be deactivated for laps on a racetrack. One of the emotional highlights is the newest generation of the DCC adaptive chassis control, whose choice of driving profiles includes a race mode. Klaus is thrilled. The R variant reaches 260 kilometers an hour here in the straightaway, and he says 270 is possible on the Autobahn. When you hit the brakes at that speed, you feel the seatbelt more than you'd like. But a powerful brake system is just what a car this sporty needs. In the interior, the Golf flagship boasts a three-spoke leather sports steering wheel, automatic climate control, and a large touchscreen. The R variant always comes with a direct shift gearbox and four-motion permanent four-wheel drive. Only high-quality materials go into the Golf R, and an R logo graces the sport seats. Klaus can hardly believe this is a small van. It definitely feels like a sports car here on the Ascari race course. Then he tests the car at a lower speed. After all, it has families in mind, the kids in the back and mom and dad in the front on shopping trips. The car and its engine are both well suited for everyday use too. On the Ascari racetrack, our car tester is very impressed. The car has lots of power, a top-notch transmission, good brakes, and precise steering. The new VW Golf R variant offers driving fun, room, and safety. With a whopping 221 kilowatt engine and a 1,620 liters of storage space, it leaves little to be desired. In Germany, the R variant starts at 42,925 euros. Car tester Reinhold Deisenhofer says most people think of movie stars when they think of Hollywood, but there's also a tiny village of that name, population barely a hundred, in Ireland. He's here to test the new Opel Insignia, the typical company car. Most drivers want their office on wheels to get from A to B quickly, quietly, smoothly, and economically. So he's going to see how well the Insignia powered by the Whisper diesel can do just that. Schauen wir uns jetzt an. Opel's product offensive is moving ahead full speed. That includes a thorough upgrade of their range of diesel engines. The market debut of the 2.0 CDTI ushered in a new generation of diesels and three power outputs for Opel models from the Corsa to the Insignia. The two-liter diesel in the Insignia we tested is touted as quieter, cleaner, and more fuel efficient. The new leader of the diesel pack boasts 125 kilowatts of power and 400 newton meters of torque, adding up to 4% more performance and 14% more torque than its predecessor. Opel's Alpha Wolf leaps from 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 9.4 seconds, reaching a top speed of 220 kilometers per hour. The car maker rates fuel consumption as 4.7 liters per 100 kilometers. Reinhold points out that 80% of Germany's Insignia buyers choose a station wagon and 85% want a diesel engine. The introduction of the Whisper diesel will probably increase this number. From inside the car, the 170 horsepower engine is as quiet as a gasoline-powered one and just as sensitive in responding to the pedal. HMI stands for Human Machine Interface, a networked front cabin through which the driver communicates with the car. That includes the steering wheel control interface, the center console's touchscreen, speech recognition, and the instrument cluster in front of the driver, all designed to minimize distractions in traffic. The 2-liter CDTI uses the Blue Injection SCR system to remove nitrogen oxide from its emissions, much as trucks do. A smidgen of AdBlue, a mixture of urea and distilled water, is injected into the exhaust. 
The resulting ammonia breaks the nitrogen oxide down into harmless nitrogen and steam. Feinhold concludes that the Whisper diesel is a whole new generation. It has more power and accelerates better than its predecessor, and it produces less vibration. It could be a tad sportier, but the insignia is a bit too porky for that. If it were lighter, it would be nimbler. Here, quality carries weight. The 1972 Porsche 911 Targa is one for purists. No digital gimmickry, no fancy assists, just pure engineering and mechanics. It's brimming with power and panache. Many things about it may seem out of date, but never old. The Targa followed no trend. This is truly a classic of the timeless variety which counts for so much more. Its form followed a concept and the principle of craftsmanship, not computer-aided design. The Porsche 911 was a dream out of reach for most drivers' budgets. When first launched, it was the mark of a successful man or woman. Now, as a vintage car, it remains an exclusive asset affordable only to a select few. The previous owner of this 911 T Targa put some 40,000 euros into it, not to buy it, but just to restore it. The window of opportunity for getting hold of an original 911 on the cheap closed long ago sometime around the early 1990s at the latest. The prices have been climbing ever since. As long as the overall condition is sound, especially of the body, even a fairly expensive renovation can be well worth the investment. The interior is likewise a straightforward affair, reduced to the technical essentials for a high-performance sports car. The air-cooled engine has an irresistible sound, a masterpiece of old-school engineering. An early Targa like this is not meant for showing off. Fans of low-riding, brawny-sounding cool might prefer other models. The Targa has a style of its own, of a pedigree sports car. And that means a driver to match, one with the power to put a foot on the brakes and some muscle into the non-power steering. Vintage car collector Marcos Diamant confirms that this kind of Porsche is not for wimps. It means work and contact with the road, something for enthusiasts. It's not state-of-the-art Porsche with driver assists. This car has a certain firmness and sturdiness, so you know you're in a sports car with the open sky above you. That's the unique charm of the Targa. This 911 is not the best entry model into classic car circles. For one, the handling takes some getting used to. And for another, repairs and maintenance are in the same price class as the car itself. Porsche rolled out the first 911 Targa in 1965 in the form of a highly safety-conscious convertible. At the time, the A-pillars did without. Reinforced high-strength materials had not yet been developed. Instead, the engineers put a stainless steel clad roll bar in behind the front seats. No other car at the time had one. What started as a practical but ugly solution later became the Targa's trademark.
The Targa's top was detachable, but in the long run, that meant extra wear and tear. If there was no room left under the front hood, it could also be stowed behind the seats. Marcus Diamant's passion for vintage cars has partly to do with his distaste for today's vehicles, especially because they tend to look increasingly alike. Back when cars were developed mainly by the engineers, they were the ones who determined the final product. Today, in his opinion, the marketing people have far too much say in it. Now, what's important is what the market demands, not what the brand represents. Today, all the cars have the same shape, an egg shape, rounded off. Every car used to have its own personality, so you could spot the model from the horizon. The vintage cars put you into a time machine and give you a feel for what life was like 40 years ago. The 1972 Porsche Targa has no problem handling everyday driving. But the driver might have problems handling the target. It takes work. There's no time to relax, sit back, and enjoy the ride. But even if the T-Line's 130 horsepower engine is noticeably weaker than the S-Line's 190 horsepower, it's still fun to drive, and as fast as anyone's likely to need. And in the next edition of Drive It, a new mini born and bred on the racetrack, the John Cooper Works. And we check out the new Skoda Superb.